Well, I want to welcome you to the study of Luke. And uh, we are in chapter 10 and, uh, of this interesting, interesting book. Uh, the major sections of Luke, we had, uh, the, obviously, introductory few chapters. Then he had the Galilean ministry that went from chapter 4 to chapter 9. And now we're going in the next section, which is towards Jerusalem, chapters 10 through 19. The first, uh, up to chapter 9, is considered the great Galilean ministry. That was the focus. That's where he called his disciples and so forth. Now they're going to get some practical experience and teaching on their way to Jerusalem. When we get to chapter 19, through the end, we're going to have this final offer of the kingdom, the rejection of that, the sacrifice, and then, of course, the resurrection and ascension in the last chapter. So there's 24 chapters, and we're almost at the halfway point here. So we're going from the Galilean ministry last time now to towards Jerusalem, a major another section opening up here. And so in this chapter, we're going to spend a few verses about sending out the disciples. This is something that's recorded only in Luke, by the way. It's interesting. And we're going to answer the question, what shall I do? That is posed to him by a lawyer. We're going to get the very famous parable, and I don't think it's a parable, I think it was an actual incident, but anyway, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And uh, then they uh, finished uh, a visit to Bethany with some lessons. Now Luke was a Greek physician, and uh, being a Greek, he's a Gentile. Being a physician, he's focusing on Jesus' humanity. And uh, Matthew focuses on Jesus' kingship, setting up his king, kingdom. He, Matthew's focus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and so on. Mark is really Peter's um, amanuensis, and uh, it really deals with uh, Jesus as a servant. Matthew's uh, gospel, or Greek's, uh, Mark's gospel, is like a shooting script. It's action, action, action all the way through. John, the last one, is, deals with who Jesus actually is, his deity. But Luke really focuses on his humanity. It's a very hu That's one reason I think it's so popular with people. You really get a feeling of Jesus' humanity. Luke was a Gentile, and as such, he focuses on the reality that the gospel has for all nations. Many things that are very Jewish, he really sort of passes over. He really puts things in perspective for the Gentile. And uh, that's another reason it's probably so popular to, to many of us. The Old Testament, by the way, it isn't just Luke. The Old Testament uh, makes it clear that the Messiah would bring blessings to all nations. There are many prophecies throughout the Old Testament that Gentiles will be beneficiary of God's kingdom, especially in Isaiah, but they're all the way through there if you look for it. Luke helps us to see through Matthew's Jewishness, his Jewish veil, if you will. And, and, and Luke, in a sense, gives us a broader perspective. It isn't so absorbed as Matthew is with the kingdom and the kingship and all of that. And so, now this section that we're going to be in also contains instructions similar to those that were given the Twelve in chapter 9. There's the twelve. We're going to encounter shortly here the seventy. And only Luke talks about those guys. And uh, he sends out seventy. Now there's a big dispute among scholars. Is it seventy or seventy-two? Uh, and, uh, but in any case, this seventy is sent out with a very special urgency. And uh, now Jesus is focusing on Jerusalem. And he's teaching his disciples openly about the cross that's coming. And uh, that may surprise many people. Now this chapter 10 is going to open with an incident only Luke talks about. This is not one of those things that's in all four Gospels. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Okay. Now the question that lurks behind all this is not a big deal, but I just want you to be aware of it. Were there 70 or 72? If you dig into this, you'll discover it's not easy to resolve. Some Greek manuscripts in verses 1 and 17 have 70, 
and other Greek manuscripts have 72. And the manuscript evidence is strong for both accounts. So it's not easy to resolve this one. No big deal, I just want you to be aware of it because you'll hear both numbers used in different places. Is there significance? Either seven or there's, there's significance to both of them. The potential symbolic significance of 70, Moses, you may recall, in Exodus 24, had 70 elders that his father-in-law suggested he appoint, and he did, and it was effective to delegate the lesser work. So there were 70 elders under Moses. We also notice from Genesis, in Genesis 10 and 11, that we list all the nations of the earth, there are 70 of them. It's very interesting. There are 70 that went down to Egypt from the family, but they came out as a nation. But in the recounting of that, then, uh, we also discover there are 70, from, from the biblical point of view, there are 70 different nations that make up the, uh, the world. Now, when you get to the Septuagint, the Greek translation, they list 72 nations rather than 70. So that doesn't help any. There were 70 members of Jacob's family that went down to Egypt during the famine, in Genesis 46. Now the Sanhedrin also was made up of 70 members because you, you didn't count the high priest unless there was a tie vote. And uh, Moses' commandments are heard in 70 languages according to rabbinic tradition. That may not be a heavy argument from our point of view, but I'll mention it in passing here. Now, what about 72? Well, the Jews had local councils of 72, we find out from references in the Mishnah. There were 72 translators of the Septuagint in the letter of Aristeus in, uh, uh, in 270 BC. The Old Testament was translated into Greek by 72 of the best Hebrew scholars in Alexandria. Uh, Ptolemy of Philadelphus funded it. They got the best scholars to translate the Jewish scriptures from the Hebrew into Greek because the average Jew in those days spoke Greek. That was the standard language. But he wanted the scriptures, that's why they did the Septuagint. But the, the records, at least some of the records show, that there were 72, six, for each of the for six from each of the 12 tribes, people speculate. So that, and the Septuagint also has a tradition of 72 nations in Genesis 10. So there's no easy way to get a bias or a perspective on this. The 70 or 72, whatever, we'll call them 70 from now on, just realize there's some different views, were people other than the 12. We're not talking about the 12 apostles now, we're talking the, these guys, who apparently remained, with, the 12 remained with Jesus on his journey. They were to give, the, these 70 were to give the gospel a jump start. Verse 2, therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, this is widely uh, misunderstood. What harvest is he talking about? He's talking about the presentation of the kingdom prior to his arrival in Jerusalem. That's the harvest. You and I aren't harvesting. We're sowing seed. Different era, different things, okay? Here they're, they're, the issue was this, the kingdom, which they rejected. Instead of accepting the kingdom, they uh, crucified him. But Jesus goes on and says, Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. Strange admonitions here, isn't it? See, their mission was dangerous from verse 3, required haste in verse 4. There's an urgency here. And into who, whatsoever house ye enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace will shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. Wow. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Now this is special instructions for these people at this time. You don't need to extrapolate this in your own neighborhood going house to house. Different issue. Okay? Different issue. Okay? 
and in whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Really? Even if it's not kosher? Anyway, let's go on. And heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. These people are selling a kingdom message. Okay? It's a message that's going to be rejected nationally. But into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Notice their job is to announce it, not convince them. Okay? They were to declare the kingdom of God. Through hospitality, people would show whether or not they believed the message of the kingdom. To the believing cities, the message was to be, the kingdom of God is near you. The Messiah was coming, and he would bring in the kingdom. Question, guys, did he? Did Jesus bring in the kingdom? No, they killed, they killed him, didn't they? They didn't accept the kingdom. And all these things are blinded, he, he, he will say as he rides that donkey. Let's go on here. Even the cities that rejected the message were to be told that the kingdom was near. It wasn't their job to make the people believe. Verse 12. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for that day, in that day for Sodom, than for that city. Boy, that's weird. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented city in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. This is an application that's holding to you, you, you um, are judged by what you have, what, what's been given to you. And uh, uh, since Chorazin and Bethsaida had, had the opportunity to see much more, more is required of them. Wow. Where does that put us? Ooh, we have more visibility. The Word of God is more available to us today than it's ever been in the history of mankind. Think about it. Now if we look at a map of northern Israel, Sidon and Tyre, of course, are on the Phoenician coast. Chorazin and Bethsaida are right there on the Sea of Galilee. And uh, then he continues, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shalt be thrust down to hell. These are tough words from the ruler of the universe. Capernaum was his headquarters. It's where he operated out of substantially. And yet, and yet, Capernaum is also there on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus warned the surrounding towns against rejecting the 70 because that meant rejecting Jesus and the Father. That's the linkage. He also singled out his adopted hometown, Capernaum, which also had been a site of his miraculous works. The miracles they saw there left him without excuse. Verse 16, He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me. And he that despises me despises him that sent me. That's bad news. The seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. So the seventy went out. They had those instructions. They came back and apparently excited. Boy, it went well, apparently. Even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. It's kind of interesting how many people are just preoccupied with demons. But I'm not going to go there. Getting to verse 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. The question is, what does that mean? When did that happen? When did Satan fall from heaven? 
A number of people have different views on this. They're hard to justify. At the cross, the cross hadn't happened yet. That can't be what he's talking about. There is a view, it's very controversial, and it, hap it happens to be one I lean to, but that does not make it correct. I'm just being candid with you. It's a view that I happen to lean towards, can't prove it, and that is that it occurred between Genesis, the first two verses of Genesis 1. And that suggests that the creation that we see from verse 2 on is a recreation of a world that had been judged. There are hints of that in Isaiah 45 and in Jeremiah 4 and other passages. And there's a whole study you can get into. You need to understand it's a very controversial idea. And there are a number of fundamental uh, guys that, re that accept that. And there's a number of good scholars that don't. One of the great authorities in this is G.H. Pember. He's, he's written extensively on it. And I, won't spend, I don't want to spend more time on it than it deserves here, but just get, get our Genesis commentary and we get into that there if you want. In any case, though, we know Satan's power is broken because Jesus has authority over it. We see ex expressed again and again and again through the Gospels. Okay. He continues, Jesus says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Who is he talking to? The 70. Is he talking to us? I'm not sure. There's a lot of evidence that their situation is different than ours. This leads to another debate. Do we have permanent power for all Christians? There are many that would, would you know, sell that idea. On the other hand, was this power unique for their particular ministry? The evidence seems to stack up in favor of the second view. The disciples had to have the power of healing to get their message, to get, credibi get credibility to the people. Okay. We notice that that was true up until the cross. Once you have the resurrection of Christ and you have the church being born and so forth, we notice something very strange. That the, if the incidents of healing get fewer. When you get to Paul, there are healings, but they're not predictable. Paul himself had a thorn in the flesh, he called it. Prayed three times. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. He had a friend, Trophimus, that was, was um, he left sick. Why didn't he heal him? We get the impression that this healing sign or authentication was operative before the cross, essentially. Not the only time. I'm not saying God doesn't heal. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm, I'm not sure what we mean when we say the gift of healing. Because in every situation, God is sovereign. I think it's a mistake to presume that by some ritual, you can guarantee healing, because that just doesn't happen. There's too many cases where God is still sovereign. Yes, he'll heal, but it's a whole different context. Anyway, he continues here, Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. These guys came all excited because they had all this experiential uh, evidence of the healings. He's saying that's not what you should be rejoicing about. You should rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Vastly more permanent, vastly more significant, and that's uh, that we should be certain in that camp. I like what Walter Martin says. I never met a demon I liked. <laughs> he used to throw that out freely. He was anyway. Let's go on here, verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. How interesting it is how God uses the humble, the seemingly ill-equipped, 
And uh, he rejoices in that. The foolishness of God. Huh? The people who were following Jesus were not the important people of the nation. They were not considered the wise and learned. Now both Paul and Luke will come later. They're not in that crowd. They're a decade later or more. They had become, like, the people there, they had become like little children to enter into the kingdom, and thus they knew the Son and the Father. That's exciting. Jesus can use, all things are delivered to me of my Father. And no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Okay. And he turned, and he turned him to, unto his disciples. And said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Very privileged. Very privileged they were. All things are delivered to me of my Father, Jesus says. And no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. The one they reject is the only one who can open the portal to the Father. They that rejected him were blinded. And we're going to see him declare that officially when he rides that donkey into Jerusalem. Now the, those that are rejected were blinded but not forever. Paul will tell us in Romans 11.25 that Israel was blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And uh, come in where? Now there's a question that constantly comes up for all of us. What shall I do? It's Genesis 3, 7 once again. You remember Genesis 3, 7? Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with coats of uh, fig leaves. Adam and Eve had sinned. And uh, they tried to cover themselves with leaves. They, that was the first act of religion on the planet Earth. Religion is man's attempt to reconcile himself with God. And he can't do that. God taught him that there in verse 7 of chapter Genesis 3. God gave them skins to cover them. Why? Because it was more durable than fig leaves? No, 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 no. It's a teaching. They're being taught that by, the de the, uh, by an innocent death they would be covered. It's a, it's a, it's a theological teaching. Genesis 3, 7. Well, we have this, now this comes up with this lawyer. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Boy, that is a good question. That is a good question. Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Interesting use of phrase. And this is, shows up all through the scripture, of course. There are three matters that emerge here. That there is a life that is eternal. Right? There is a life that is eternal. He understood that. It's an inheritance. It's an inheritance. It's not something you can earn, but it is something you can forfeit. Those aren't the same thing. It is an inheritance. And I, an inheritance can be forfeited. Ask Reuben about that. Ask Esau about that. Go through your Bible and find people who did not inherit because of a lack of obedience and faith. The third matter here is by what means can qualify for that inheritance. What, what means can qualify? What, what do you have to do to qualify for that inheritance? That's really what the... The, the, this lawyer was zeroing in on. Now the question in this case was not sincere. As can be seen from two points in the text. The lawyer wanted to test Jesus. It's sort of a, a test question, if you will. He called Jesus a teacher. That's, a, that's sort of Luke's equivalent of a Jewish rabbi. The second point is that Jesus answered the man's question. Luke recorded that the man wished to justify himself when you get to verse 29, that'll make it very clear. So he's not asking for information. He's trying to justify himself. Jesus answered his question with two other questions. 
Some people call that the Socratic method, answering a question with another question. And uh, he answered his question with two other questions, driving the law expert back to the Old Testament law. That's what he had, that's what he used. He said to them, what is written in the law? How readest thou? That's Jesus responding to him with a question. Now the expert, interestingly enough, answered correctly by quoting the Shema from Deuteronomy 6.5, which later Jesus will identify as the greatest commandment. The Shema. Deuteronomy 6.5. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy, all thy soul, all thy strength, and all thy mind. And Leviticus 19.18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two commandments. In another context, Jesus highlights as the, that says it all. One must love God and, one, and one's fellow man in order to keep the law properly. Notice this lawyer linked the concept of the law with the concept of love. It's implicitly. That's not obvious. And yet it is obvious. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Those are quotes out of the Torah. Deuteronomy 6.5, the Shema, and Leviticus 19.18, Love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay. So he's quoting the Shema, as I say, and he cor correctly connects law with love, even the question of loving a neighbor. Okay. But here's where you begin to realize he's... he's Weaseling out of this. And he said, and Jesus, said and Jesus said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. If you can. <laughs> let's, let's, us, let us not get confused ourselves. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You can do all the law keeping. You can you try to do all you can. You won't do enough to justify yourself. Because you can't do it perfectly. The law is our schoolmaster. It's intended to show us our need for a savior. The law is to show our need for the perfections that are available only by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Paul nails us in Romans 8, for the, what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's the challenge, to walk by the spirit, not the flesh. Because the flesh can't justify you. By walking after the spirit, we have imputed to us the righteousness of Christ. When he paid our entrance fee to heaven and on the cross. The technical term for that is justification. If you use the word salvation, that's ambiguous. That can mean many things. That's justification. The minute you trust Christ, you have his righteousness imputed to you. You can't add to it. It's insulting to even try. That's called blasphemy. Trying to add to what Christ completed on your behalf shows you don't understand the situation. But the lawyer, but he willingness to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? The very fact that he's going down that road tells you his question is a, was a, like a setup, not a, not a quest for information, but an attempt at justification. Who is my neighbor? Love your neighbor. Say, well, who's my, he's begging the question. Okay. Now this is, it gives rise, Jesus then just tells him a story. Many people regard this as probably the most elegant story ever written. As just a story. Very brief, very simple, very direct, very poignant. It's in the posture of a parable. And it technically probably is a parable, but I personally suspect it wasn't a contrived story. It actually happened. Jesus is recounting something that actually happened. Because it serves his purpose here. So, in parables, people don't have names. When you get to Luke 16, the players there have names. It tells you they're not parables, they're actual events. We don't have a name here, but I also suspect this was an actual event. Anyway, 
Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now to go down, if you've been to Jerusalem and go to Jericho, in the, you, you drop about 3,000 feet in 17 miles. You go down to Jericho. Okay. And he fell among thieves. This area was notorious for brigands and what have you. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. That's descriptive, isn't it? Very graphic, very simple. As I say, the road from Jericho, uh, Jerusalem to Jericho descends about 3,000 feet in a 17-mile trip. I'm always fascinated by this for a number of reasons. When John the Baptist was preaching in the Jordan near Jericho at Bethabara, so many people from Jerusalem went out to hear him that the temple had to send an inquiry team out there. You're talking 17 miles of the roughest desert around that people would walk. And they didn't, take a, didn't get a cab, you know. They walked, you know. Well, anyway, going on. Anyway, so this guy's lying there half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Didn't want to have anything to do with this. I suspect he may even walked a little faster because he, these guys that did that deed are probably still in the area. He saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. I gather he's on one side of the road there. And they gave him a wide berth. Now you understand the difference between a priest and a Levite. A priest is a direct descendant of Aaron. Of the tribe of Levi, yes, but if he's of Aaron, he's a priest. If he's of the tribe of Levi, not of Aaron, he's a Levite. Okay? And, and did service in the temple, typically. Levites are descendants of Levi, but not of Aaron. They're members of the tribe of Levi, but they're not priests. Okay. They assisted the priests that is Aaron's descendants, in the temple. And in some other areas too. Now we get, these are two guys that are the, sort of the pivotal members of that culture. Except they're Jewish, obviously. Priest and Levite. You need to understand the background of what makes a Samaritan. I'll explain in a minute. But you need to understand that he is the one that is despised by the Jews. They will have no dealings with this loser. Okay. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Now, you need to, get, to get the flavor here, you need to understand where Samaritans came from. The roots of this scorn between Jews and Samaritans goes back Centuries, in fact, seven centuries, when Assyria conquered the northern kingdom. As, as a Israel God's judgment, the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom. You realize after Solomon's death, they, they, the nation split into two groups, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom went from bad to worse. And uh, Jeroboam led the northern kingdom into idolatry. They prospered for two centuries. But then God wiped them out for their idolatry and their social injustice. The southern kingdom also fell in idolatry, but lasted more than a century longer. And in honor of God's commitment to David, they didn't go, they didn't get wiped out. They were into captivity for seven years and then returned. Big difference. But getting back to the northern kingdom, that God used the Assyrians to wipe out the northern kingdom. And uh, that's different than what happened to the south. The Assyrians had a very interesting policy when they capt you know, captured the people. They would take them and mix them up into areas where they're not used to living. They would ship the locals out to another part of their empire, and they'd bring other captives from other parts of the empire here. They deliberately commingled them to avoid any nationalism, any cohesiveness that might lead to rebellion. That was the policy. But what that means is they really ended up erasing their cultural roots, in a sense, okay? 
And, to, and so that's to break down their tribal loyalties and family loyalties and so forth. So the Israelites in the northern kingdom that were captives of, of the Assyrians lose their identity as Jews. The residents of the northern kingdom became mixed. Some Jews and non-Jews commingled and having families and generations or two go by. So they are considered half Jewish. Not exactly Jewish, not accepted by the Jews, and yet sort of, you see. That's, why, that's what the capital of the northern kingdom was Samaria. So they're known as Samaritans, the descendants are. The Samaritans did embrace the Torah and, and some aspects of Judaism. In fact, in certain debates about the Torah, the Samaritans are more correct than the Jews. There are several areas where they have difference of opinion. And if you study that area, you discover the Samaritans are more correct. Example is Leviticus 23.19, the Feast of Firstfruits. The Feast of Firstfruits. In the text of the Torah, it's the Saturday, excuse me, it's the morning after Shabbat after Passover. Passover, because it's nailed to the calendar, can be any day of the week in any particular year. Whatever day it is, that following Shabbat, the next day after Shabbat, which we call Sunday, is the day you have the Feast of First Fruits. And that's all pr predictive of Jesus Christ, who, of course, is, is discovered to be resurrected on the first day of the week. Anyway, um, the Jews have a slightly way of inter different way of interpreting it. It's not as correct, by the way. But the Jews, anyway, viewed the non-Jews as lower than low. These are half-Jews. These are Samaritans. They're presumptuous in the Jewish mind. But that's why this story carries a certain poignancy. Because the priest and the Levite pass without helping. This despised low life, presumably, comes along has compassion on this guy, and turns out to be an example we all want to follow. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, set him on his own beast, that is the Samaritan's beast, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. He's not finished. That's just for starters. You ready for this? And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said to him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. He left a blank check, so to speak. You take care of him, and I'll make it good when I come back. That's incredible. I won't ask for a show of hands, but would you do that? I don't know. We all have opportunities to do that from time to time. Take care of it, whatsoever thou spendest more. When I come again, I'll repay thee. Now, Jesus asked the punch question here. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? See, the ultimate neighbor wasn't the Samaritan, it was Jesus whose compassion contrasted with the Jewish religious leaders who had no compassion on those who were perishing. The religious leaders should have been concerned for the lostness of the souls they dealt with. They had no concern for that. They just kept laws. They said, he that showed mercy on him, that's the lawyer answering the obvious question, he that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do thou likewise. That gives you obedience to Luke 19.18. Now, by the way, this parable stands on its own two feet. There's nothing one need add to the story. It's pretty straightforward. Here's a guy that had needs. He was rejected by the usuals. And this exception comes by and just gives of himself. That's the story. Now, so I say it stands on the There are people who try to build all kinds of analogies here. And I'm not here disparaging that. I want to show it to you because it, it may broaden your horizon. But I have to tell you, I, I'm not sure they fit that much. Some suggest an allegorical application of this parable. And the, the danger of this is you'll focus on the allegory rather than the reality of the story itself. But in an allegorical sense, the man could represent mankind. 
He'd fallen among thieves and was left half dead. And of course, Satan was a murderer from the beginning, we learned in John 8, right? So the man can represent all of us collectively. We're all half dead, if not worse. The priest represents ritualism and ceremonialism. He passed by on the other side. He had no constructive part of this at all. The Levite, there's your legalist guy, maybe, okay? The real point is, none of these can save. Only the parable giver can save. So I lay that out there. I'm sure, and this is one of those rare cases, I usually enjoy the allegorical ap illustration aspect of these. In this case, to me, I'm not disparaging it, but it doesn't capture the real essence of the story, which is personal compassion of this guy who did some good. Okay, enough of that. Let's move on. Now, it came to pass, as they went, that he entered, that he, Jesus, entered into a certain village. And a, now this happens to be Bethany, by the way. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. This is a household that had Martha and Mary and a guy by the name of Lazarus. This was a house that was in Bethany, which was very unique in that it's just on the other side of the hill. If you go up over the hill, you're up over the Mount of Olives. You go down through the Kidron Valley and you're at Jerusalem. This was a place that was close enough to Jerusalem during a holiday to be considered it's inside the legal distance of what's called a Sabbath day's journey. And so this is a very popular place for, this is where Jesus frequented uh, this family. They're very close friends. That's why, that's another side, that's why Lazarus becomes so important in the story and later and so forth. But anyway, Martha received him in her house. And in John 11 we have uh, more of this. Now Bethany is just a little bit east, maybe south, a little southeast of uh, Jerusalem. But a more meaningful thing is it's just on the other side of the Kidron Valley, just over the Mount of Olives. Jesus had to be in Jerusalem for three mandatory feasts. One is Passover, but that's misleading. Because when they say Passover, they're using the term collectively to represent three feasts. Passover itself, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is an eight-day thing, and the Feast of first fruits, which is the morning after Shabbat, after Passover. Those three feasts to get, are always together. So they collectively call it Passover. But denotatively, Passover is one of the, those three pieces of it. Connotatively, Passover refers to all three. That confuses many people. The other one that's obligatory is Feast of Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles. There are seven feasts of Moses, but these three, counting those first three as one, these three are obligatory. It was not optional. If you're an able Jewish male, you need to be in Jerusalem for these feasts. Jesus was Jewish and he had kept the law. So he had to be in Jerusalem for those feasts. Okay? And it gets confusing because you know there's three feasts and they're listed in, in De Deuteronomy. Anyway, so he, when he had to go there, he would stay in Bethany at the home of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. They were all close friends. That's the context of the event that we're about to explore here a little bit. Now, Martha had a sister named Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So get the picture. Jesus there, he's the house guest, he's teaching, Mary's at the feet, learning. Okay. Now there's going to be a contrast between these two sisters that's easily misunderstood. But a sharp contrast here. Martha was busy, busy, busy making preparations for a meal while Mary sat and listened to Jesus, okay? Martha gets a little frustrated because Mary's not helping Martha. There's things that need to be done. And Mary's sitting there learning from Jesus. Where would you be on that occasion? Probably at his feet, trying to learn too. Yeah, I understand. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him, to Jesus, and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. That seems reasonable enough, doesn't it? Huh? Jesus answers that in her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled. The word careful is like anxious. And troubled about many things. 
The word careful, merimaneo, it's uh, full of concern. You could translate it, at, she was anxious, okay. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. She wanted to study at the Master's feet. And uh, the phrase, only one thing is needful, refers to listening to his words which Mary had chosen to do. And that, that almost sounds like an admonition not to be helpful. No, it's a, it's a question of priorities. And we're going to see the same thing um, uh, in, in chapter 8, verse 21 verses. The focus of this passage is not that people should be unconcerned with household chores, but that the proper attitude toward Jesus is to listen to him and obey his words. He's what it's all about. Now this concept that we he see here in this portion of Scripture is also picked up in one of Jesus' epistles. Did you know that Jesus wrote epistles? He wrote seven of them. And um, you say, how many, how many epistles are there in the New Testament? Well, there's 21, right? Seven general epistles and 14 by Paul. No, there's 28. We always overlook the seven that Jesus put in Revelation 2 and 3. And if you look at the letter, to, the first of the letters, the first of the seven, it's a letter from Jesus to the Ephesians, church at Ephesus. It's seven verses in Revelation 2. Now the book of Revelation, as most of you are aware, but I like to throw this in anyway, is the only book of the Bible that has the audacity to say, read me, I'm special. All through the Bible, there's admonition to read the Bible, collectively. Only one book has the audacity, the chutzpah, if I may, to say, read me, and you're going to get a special blessing. That's the book of Revelation. And when you do that, you'll discover the only part of it that applies to you directly right now is chapter 2 and 3, those seven letters. A lot of other interesting things there, yes, but those seven letters are the rich, practical, poignant letters to you and I, to you and me. So if you want a certain blessing, if you're ever in, that, if you're ever in the need of a blessing, I'll tell you a surefire way to do it. Sit down and read Revelation. That's a promise he makes. You'll be blessed. God promises to give you a blessing if you read that book. Remember that. Now, Revelation 2 and 3 are what we need to focus on. There are seven letters to, for the church, seven letters that have a code phrase, he that hath ears, let him hear. That's a little wrap-up phrase on each of the seven letters. Okay. Now, the first letter is to Ephesus. Now, the Ephesians did a terrific job at keeping out false doctrine. You've tried to say they are apostles and are not, and found them liars. They were really sharp on their doctrine. They were really thorough and diligent on their doctrine, getting out, keeping out false doctrine. That's to be commended, and Jesus does commend them for that. And then the report, each one of these letters is a report card. And when you get to the point in the report card, he says, nevertheless, Visualize your boss calling you in for a review. Say you did, sure did pretty good on this, 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 this. Nevertheless, ooh, am I going to get a pink slip? What's going on here? That diligent came at a cost. They were very orthodox, but they were dead. They had lost their first love. They were so busy on the business of the king, that they had no time for the king. You learn about Jesus Christ from the Word of God, but you grow in fellowship with him in your devotional time. Studying the Bible and memorizing and making outlines and all that's great, but they don't replace devotional time at his feet. And your fear of God comes from your devotional time. They were so busy in the service of the king, they didn't have time for the king, they needed to be more like Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's where we all need to be. No matter how much pressure, how much busyness we get entangled with, don't be robbed of private time at his feet. 
Well, okay, uh, we, the Galilean ministry, we have these primary uh, thing, uh, four major sections, and we've just gone from chapter 9 into chapter 10, the first of a series of this traveling towards Jerusalem. And so in the next session, I want you to read Luke chapter 11. It's an easy chapter. It's good stuff, ba good basic stuff. But one of the things you're going to encounter there, I want you to, don't just read it, I want you to study chapter 11 for next time. But among the topics that you'll encounter, of course, is a thing we call the Lord's Prayer. Now that's an unfortunate label, because it's misleading. They ask him to teach them to pray, and so he gives them a model prayer. You should call that the disciples model, or it's a model prayer. It's not an appropriate prayer for Jesus to pray to the Father. It's not the Lord's Prayer. You find the real Lord's Prayer in John 17. And boy, is that a tour. It's different. That chapter, chapter 17 of John, you get a glimpse of the devotion between the Son and His Father. Different. That's the Lord's Prayer. But we use that label for this model prayer that Jesus gives his disciples, and it shows up in Luke chapter 11. And what I'd like you to do for next time, we're going to get a scratch pad, and notice the seven petitions that make it up. And see if you can understand. Make your, think, think through, see if you can identify what those seven petitions are. And there's, and uh, we'll, 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 obviously go through that next time. So analyze each of the seven petitions of the Lord's Prayer. And with that, let you and I stand for a closing prayer. Luke is just good practical stuff. Very real, very personal. And uh, we're going to find that's, uh, I think that's one of the reasons Luke is so popular. He's so, he's so human, so personal. Uh, uh, I love Paul, but boy, he, he, he flies in a different stratosphere. Luke is right here just at the ground, um, getting us an insight as to, you really feel you're at, at the Lord's feet. Let's bow our hearts.